Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today we're taking you through the best bits, the five dysfunctions of a team by Patrick Lencioni. It's not finance, it's not strategy, it's not technology, it's actually teamwork that remains the ultimate competitive advantage. And that's for two reasons. Firstly, because it's so powerful, but secondly, because it's so rare. If you can get all the people in an organization sitting on the same canoe with a row that's paddling all in the same direction, all coordinated, in reality, you can dominate any industry, any market, or really any competition at any time. For all the attention it receives, the scholars, the researchers, the coaches, the teachers, the media, everyone keeps talking about teamwork and the importance of teamwork, but it remains as elusive as ever. Yeah, I've never really come across anyone who's studied the aspects or functions of a team or the dynamics, but I think Patrick, he does a very good job of explaining the five dysfunctions. He does it in the style of a fable. So this little story, he talks about a fictional made-up company called Decision Tech. They used to be at the top of their game uh, as a relatively new startup that was just uh, beginning to pick up steam, but then things started to fall apart. Critical deadlines were being missed, employees were leaving, morale was low, there was backstabbing everywhere, there was really no sense of unity or camaraderie. Uh, everything was taking too long, nothing was getting done, and eventually got so bad to the point where the founder, Big Bad Jeff, the old CEO, was asked, Maybe it's time to step aside and let's let someone else take the reins. Yeah, so they, the board, they gave Jeff the ass here and they needed to find a new leader. And who they found was a lady called Catherine. So she was older than the rest of them, about 57 years old, and was used to a very, very different culture. She started off in the military, was a mother of three boys, taught seventh grade as a teacher. And at the age of 37, she upskilled herself and grew over the span of 15 years to become a bit of a powerhouse in a different industry. And here she was today, coming back out of retirement to take over this mammoth task. When she first stepped in, some of the employees were a bit skeptical, this this older lady who had no experience in tech, uh, but of course, they, they were willing to give her a shot. Thankfully, the chairman of the board said, Catherine's the right person to build this team, because when Catherine stepped in, she just saw an absolute mess. She saw um, these passive aggressive attacks everywhere, people rolling their eyes. Everyone was working in their own silos. There was no collaboration. There was dudes... Uh, just scrolling through the emails in meetings. There was laptops everywhere. Uh, there was one guy who was the head of sales. He just wanted the targets to be as low as possible so his team could beat them. Everyone was focused on their own individual success and no one was really working together as a team. Mate, I was that bloke with a laptop out in the meeting. Oh, you've whipped it, it out? Clearly. Yeah, no. <laughs> in the internal meetings, sometimes with the previous manager when I thought it was pointless and I wasn't on board of what was going on and I had shit to do I just I'd pull out the laptop and just start hammering away that's a surefire sign of a dysfunctional team right that there. is and a bit of a dysfunctional employee probably at the time as well so she thought alright enough's enough this team is obviously dysfunctional she's been around long enough to know where dysfunction lies so she called an offsite. And this is where she got all of her senior leadership team who all themselves had their own teams, but it was really this leadership team that she needed to crack some sense into. So this offsite is about 100 k's out of the city. They went there for a few days like a hotel to really nut everything out. So on day one at 9 a.m. of this offsite, she stood up in front of the room and said to everybody, we've got more experience and our executive team is more talented than any of our competitors. We've got more cash than they do. We've got better technology than they do. We've got a more powerful board of directors. So how come we're behind two of our competitors? How come we're coming third in our industry in terms of both revenue and customer growth? Now, at this stage, she'd been around long enough interviewing every member of the board, different members of the team at all different levels. And she came to the conclusion that they're not functioning as a team. In fact, they're quite dysfunctional. So at that moment, she went over to the whiteboard, she pulled out the whiteboard marker and said, over the years, I've come to the conclusion there are five reasons why a team is dysfunctional. And then she drew a triangle on the whiteboard with four horizontal lines. And she said, over the course of the next few days, we're going to fulfill the following model. Right now, I'm going to start with the first dysfunction. Great teams do not hold back with one another. They're unafraid to air their dirty laundry. They admit their mistakes, their weaknesses, their concerns without any fear. And uh, Catherine said to these guys that the first dysfunction and the dysfunction that is clearly evident within the team around her was an absence of trust. So the first thing she did was a bit of a bit odd. Everyone in the team thought they were going to do something really efficient and just get straight into nutting out what their goals are. But instead, the first part of the session, she asked everyone to go around the circle and tell a little bit about their personal histories. 
So this is a bit of a surprise, but as they went around, there was almost a gem or two with every single employee. One bloke, Carlos, he was the oldest of nine kids. Mikey, she studied ballet. Martin spent his child in India. Nick discovered that he played basketball with Catherine's husband. Now, on the surface, it might seem a little bit of pointless small talk, but it's really quite amazing because just after 45 minutes, even this extremely mild personal disclosure, the team seemed a little bit tighter and more at ease with each other during any other time in the past year. So that was the first little soft opener. Next, Catherine started to step it up a little bit more. After the lightness of hearing about people's childhoods and where they grew up and stuff, she wanted to give them a bit more of a challenge and each person had to announce to each other what they believed was their greatest strength and also their single biggest weakness in terms of how it came to contributing to the team's success. So they went around the circle and they all shared something quite vulnerable. So Nick said... He comes across as arrogant. Everyone was very surprised with Nick dropping that one because they all knew it and they didn't think Nick would admit it. Then you got Jeff here. He said he's really afraid to fail and he over-engineers stuff because of this. Now, Jeff's the old CEO, right? And he admitted that this is probably the reason why the board gave him the arse and everyone's like, oh, shit, that's quite vulnerable there, Jeff. But then another person, Mikey, toward the end, she dropped something not vulnerable at all. She said her biggest weakness is her poor financial skills and uh, unfortunately a bit of a Spoiler alert here, but Mikey got the ass <laughs> toward the end of the book. She wasn't That's ready to just share her stuff uh, as much as all the other colleagues. Yeah, it's nowhere near on the same level. Just something basic as financial skills, and and Mikey, she was the head of marketing, so it didn't. It wasn't even anything vitally important that she needed financial skills compared to the other two who were dropping some serious, deeper stuff. So trust lies at the heart of a functioning, cohesive team. Without it, teamwork is impossible. And unfortunately, of course, trust is just one of these airy-fairy, fluffy words that gets thrown around. You probably go to a few meetings where the boss says everyone needs to trust each other. We need to develop trust. Mm. But a lot of it is just words and it, it's lost a bit of its meaning because it's been used and misused so often. Yeah, when there's no trust in the group, everyone's kind of just tiptoeing around each other, being careful, being somewhat political and not really getting to any honesty. And no one's really comfortable sitting around being vulnerable with each other. So in the absence of trust, what you can do is you conceal your weaknesses. You're not going to ask for help. You're going to hold grudges. You're not going to tap into other people's skills and experiences because you're weak in a certain area. And you're going to seriously dread meetings, which we'll explain about in a bit. So the biggest, that dysfunction number one is that absence of trust. So of course, to become functional, we need to build trust. But of course, it can't happen overnight. Uh, There's a few of those exercises like starting off with something easy like those personal histories where you can spend an hour of everyone getting to know each other and learning something a little bit deeper outside of work. Then you've got those the next level which is talking about the team's effectiveness, people's strengths and weaknesses. You need to dig a little deeper to admit a few weaknesses and get everybody uh, trusting each other. Now, the role of the lead is really important here. If you're someone who's leading the team and coordinating this trust and you're trying to build it, The most important thing to do is for the leader to share the most vulnerability at the very start. That way, she's kind of setting the bar and setting the standard of where it goes. So if she shares something very, very vulnerable, then everyone else feels like they're comfortable enough to go to that level as well. So trust is like the the first dysfunction. It's the bottom of this triangle or this pyramid. Uh, It's the base. You need this first before you can step up to the next one because you need everybody to trust each other in order to make people feel comfortable, to have a bit of conflict and to not hesitate, to not hold back, to allow themselves to really unleash some a bit of passion and sometimes a bit of emotion. So Catherine here, she's at the whiteboard. She's telling the team just above this absence of trust is the fear of conflict, which is the second dysfunction. Because if we don't trust one another, then we're not going to engage in open, constructive, ideological conflict. And I remember Ray Dalio in principles and he really champions this idea of radical transparency I remember and he said honest confrontation is much better than artificial harmony and a lot of teams if they're not engaging in in conflicts and they're too scared of it they're living in artificial harmony and they're not really getting to that honest truth. People might think that conflict is a bad thing and that if everybody's sort of happy and friendly and working together and harmonious, then that's a good way for the team to be. But of course, a lot of this harmony is just artificial. It's just fake. It's just surface bullshit. Uh, You need a bit of conflict underneath. Now, conflict 
is different from tension. Um, this fictional team here had a lot of tension where people didn't really like each other. They didn't, they didn't really agree with what other people were doing. So it was just this tension simmering below the surface and on top they had this fake harmony. So that's a, mm. a, a shocking place to be in. Yeah, so when you got that tension, you need to be there kind of mining it out, kind of prodding it out and then letting it all out and that's when the conflict happens and then you resolve it and then magically the tension kind of disappears and dissipates. And quite interestingly, the battleground for all this conflict is in meetings. She says this is the most important place for conflict. She says that uh, meetings should be as enjoyable, if not more enjoyable, than going to the movies. She said people love going to the movies. You know, they'll love you know two hours sitting down watching something, but they'll hate going into the office and sitting in a two-hour meeting. And the big reason, she says, is that all these meetings are missing the vital element of movies that keep us hooked, and that's the, the conflict. That's the airing and the resolving of conflict. Yeah, I think it was a hard sell on you getting this part <laughs> in the episode. You don't believe it one, I, for I one second. I don't think I would... Uh, if I had the choice of a movie or a meeting, 100% of the time I'm picking a movie. Well, here are reasoning out here, right? So oh, I'll listen to that. You got 90 minutes, same time for a meeting. That's a long meeting. Most meetings that we go into, right, they're just... They are just boring. It is like watching a mo- movie and nothing happens the whole time. You're just watching people just sit there. Um, you're looking at this door and you know the serial killer's in there and then you got the hero protagonist and the whole movie you're just watching it not going to that door and then the movie ends. Very boring. Very that's boring very movie. boring. So that's what Catherine's <laughs> saying most of our meetings are, are like. Yeah. Now, have you actually been in a meeting where there's a lot of conflict and stuff like that? Uh, I can't say I've been in a meeting that's like uh, movie level conflict. No, I wouldn't say movie level, but there has there has been. I think I can see the correlation where she's going. When there is mm. conflict out there, you do get at the edge of your seat, and you do get much more engaged. And time does seem to fly much more quickly. But I probably still prefer watching movie. <laughs> <laughs> See what she's going though. The important thing is that all great relationships, the ones that last and get stronger over time, they need conflict in order to grow. So that's your personal relationships, your friendships, um, your romantic relationships, your family relationships. All of these need a bit of conflict from time to time. And the same goes for in the office. If it's all just friendly and rose and harmonious and people are keeping all the tension to themselves, you're never going to get stronger as a team. You need to air out that conflict and work through it together. So, we're avoiding all kinds of mean-spirited attacks here, but we are airing out all the passion, emotion, and frustration. And the teams who've got that trust below, they'll know that when someone's really getting frustrated at someone else or what they're proposing or anything like that, they know that they've got the results of the team at heart and it's not a personal attack here. And they're not scared of hurting another team member's feelings because they know that the team knows that they've got the best interests. Yeah, I think the worst type of conflict is that underlying tension that's been bubbling up inside and people keep it to themselves and then they just unleash in some kind of sarcastic or some mean or some aggressive type of assault saying you're shit at your job, you're horrendous at everything you do. That's bad conflict. Hmm. Uh, The better conflict is when there is trust and you're doing it not in an emotional way, just an objective way saying here are all the problems that we're working through. If everybody's got the, the relationships and the trust to be able to work together, that regular lower level conflict is going to be very productive. Yeah, so in the context of Catherine here, we're talking about a team of a huge organization, but I think it can be drilled down to just teams of two. Like for us, whenever we got that tension, which always comes up when you're working with someone, we do have that trust below there to know that it's Billy time. And Billy, I think we dropped it in an episode before where... uh, One of our mates, Billy. One of our mates, Billy, he's got a lot of tension and which manifests as passive aggressive attacks that's all we don't want so when it is time to release the tension we drop it out be straight with each other knowing that we both want the same thing when that is like good results for what we're trying to do as you say it's quite easy to once the billy is released like you might be in your head you're building up all this tension or this person says this or this person thinks this and you're in your own head and it's just building up to something massive but as soon as the billy is released you realize oh actually that wasn't such a big deal after all yeah and you're better off for it after it 100 percent now again the leader here if you are leading a bigger team there is a responsibility to model the appropriate level Mm. of conflict one thing you need to do is notice when there's tension if you say something and someone at the corner of the meeting just rolls their eyes you need to call them out Mm. on it if you got that level of trust let them air it out let that tension come out and then you can engage in the conflict 
and you're going to be better off for it. Yeah, and you might think that if you know there's someone in the team is you feel like they're getting picked on, it's going to be um, natural for you to want to stick up for them and protect them and jump in and try to defend them. But that's just like that's really killing the conflict. You need to let it air out and you need to let it see through its natural course. So this is really related to the third dysfunction, which is the third hierarchy on this pyramid. Because if you don't have this conflict where everyone gets out their opinions and everyone disagrees and everything like that, then nobody's full perspective or opinion will be allowed to enter the room. And if that's not allowed to enter the room, they're not going to actually commit to the team's results and where they're actually heading to. So the big dog, Catherine, she's up at the whiteboard filling in the third dysfunction, which is the lack of commitment. Now, you might think that the best performing teams are the ones where somebody says an idea um, about the direction that they should take and everybody just nods along in agreement behind them. You might think that's great. Everyone's consensus. Everyone's happy. Everyone's in the same direction. But really, without going through the trust and the conflict first, nobody's really on board with that idea until everybody feels like their ideas have been heard and everybody has weighed up rationally and objectively what is the best path and you pick a path. Uh, until then, people aren't going to be on board. They might not along, but they're not actually going to take action towards it. You need everyone unloading their opinions, whether it's the opposite of other people's opinions and dealing that conflict before you get this commitment. So it's a function of two things. The worst thing, ironically, is consensus because that means you haven't heard many viewpoints. You probably just heard one viewpoint. Mm. You're better off getting 10 which are opposing each other. Then you know it's much more likely that you're going to get the most rationally best decision by the end of it. If everyone just nods along to the one person, then you're in a bit of trouble. <laughs> you might think consensus coming quickly is a good thing, but really consensus is just some kind of middle ground approach that's trying to please everyone. What you really need in order to, to get commitment is you need two elements. You need clarity and you need buy-in. So the best teams, they make it very, very clear exactly what the goal is. And so the biggest element of commitment is buy-in. People need to buy into whatever the decision is made. Now, the decision is that is it's not the consensus that everyone agrees with. In fact, some people are probably going to actually disagree with that decision because that means that you've got strong opposed views and you've decided which is the better path to take. But then you need everyone to buy in. Even the people who voted against the decision still need to buy in to the direction that you're taking. Yeah, if anyone's harboring doubts whether to support the action agreed upon, then you're in a bit of trouble. Mm. So if you think about if that person rolling their eyes at the corner of the meeting room, as soon as you call them out, that means they've got no choice to actually drop what they're thinking. Mm. And the reason they're rolling their eyes, maybe it's got a lot of merit, the mm. reason why they're rolling it. But once it's aired, everyone can speak about that. And then the person rolling their eyes, that's all they want to know. They want their opinion to be out there and then everyone to at least consider it before they move on. And if it's someone else's idea that they go with, then she'll be buying into it also. So great teams unite behind decisions and commit to clear course of action. In any teams that fail to have this commitment where every single person buys in, there's going to be ambiguity among the team about which direction to take and what the priorities are. They're going to see windows of opportunity open and close. There's going to be excessive analysis and they're never going to actually start moving towards the goal. There's going to be a lack of confidence and there's going to be a huge fear of failure. So like all the other dysfunctions we've looked at, dysfunction number three, lack of commitment, also leads to dysfunction number four. So Catherine in the meeting, she says, the next dysfunction is avoidance of accountability. Because once we've achieved clarity and buy-in, it is then that we have to hold each other accountable for what we sign up to do for high standards of performance and behavior. As simple as it sounds, most executives actually hate doing it. Uh, a lot of bosses are probably good at holding their their direct reports accountable, but in that executive team, they struggle to hold each other accountable. So to look across at the leader of a different department and call them out is, is, a, is much more challenging than calling out somebody who reports to you. Yeah, because you need someone on the team to be sitting on one end of the table calling out the other peer because they matter, right? They've got the trust now and they're not afraid of that conflict and they've all committed to something. Now they're thinking, why the hell aren't you coming along with us? What's wrong with you at the moment? Yeah, there's a lot of uh, personal discomfort that comes with that, looking someone in the eyes and, and saying that they're not living up to expectations. But it's vital that you go through that initial discomfort because the whole team is going to be much stronger on the other side. So the essence of this dysfunction is the unwillingness of all the team members to tolerate that interpersonal discomfort and entering the danger with one another. 
as politically incorrect as it sounds, the most efficient means of maintaining high standards is actually just peer pressure. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It sounds wrong to say, but you actually need peer pressure. So you've gone through these levels. You've gone. You've built the trust. You've aired out the conflict. You've all picked a path, and everybody is committed and they're on board. They've bought in. You need to hold each other accountable here. And if if ninety uh, percent of the team are all working together, and there's that one person that isn't living up to it, it's the peer pressure that's actually going to drag that that bottom ten percent up with the rest of the team. So a team that's avoiding accountability is encouraging mediocrity and obviously isn't going to get results. You're creating resentment among the team and everyone has got different stands performance. You're the one who's like putting in all the hours and the heart and soul into the job. Then you got the person who's kind of hiding a little mm. bit and you need to kind of probably give the boot. <laughs> exactly. Catherine had no problem giving the people <laughs> the boot. You need to shift away from individual performance and just focus solely on team achievement. It's uh, Once you start looking at the team achievement, it becomes easier for the team to hold each other accountable. If all the rewards are linked to individual performance, everybody's just out for themselves. But once those rewards shift to the team performance, everybody's going to be looking left and right to say, hey, are you working together with us mm. on the team? Uh, because the team wins or loses as one collective unit. Sports obviously do a very good job at this. If you look at any interview after the game with the best on ground performance person, every time they're kind of shedding off any of the focus on them and how mm. good they were and putting all the focus on a team. It's actually made post-match interviews so bloody boring, it's insane. But very predictable. <laughs> very predictable and boring. You almost want someone to come in and say, hey, yeah, it was all me. <laughs> it was much better than everyone else. But from a team point of view, this is what they're doing. They're making the results of the team before their own individual results. And this brings us to the final, the fifth dysfunction that uh, Big Catherine's chucking up on the whiteboard at the very top of the pyramid. And the dysfunction here is inattention to results. She loves her sports analogies and she said in sports, there's a real clear score at the end of the game. You know if you've succeeded or failed, there's very little room for ambiguity, which means there's very little room for subjective, interpretive, ego-driven success. It's very common. You need to actually set goals that are possible for failure to actually know how you're going. So as the leader, Catherine wanted everybody to focus on these team results. Everybody was too focused on their own results. The head of marketing was focused on how much good press are we getting. The financial controller was thinking, how, how are we spending? Like, are we keeping our costs down? The head of technology was focused on creating new products. The head of business development was focused on bringing in new customers. So each of the different teams were focused on their own individual team results. Catherine here, she had to work out what is the one overarching result that we want as a collective unit. And it was all about having this one united vision and publicly declaring these results that everybody was working towards. So when they were brainstorming what KPIs to focus on, everyone obviously dropped the ones that were relevant to their department. So they started off with 15 on the board and then they all, through this collaborative and conflict and heated discussion, they narrowed it down to one and this is what they put out in front of every, everybody to see and then everybody was on board and that knew that's what it's all about. And before Catherine was coming along, there's no way that the person who's running the product development team would dare take any budget cuts for their department and sacrifice for someone else mm. or same with marketing. But now because it's got this one thing they're measuring, all of a sudden, they're happy to compromise to help the other teams out and other departments. So in essence, what we're doing here is moving everything away from individual status to team status. So we're not letting anyone advance their own career at the expense of their team. So in summary, teamwork is vital to success. You need to as we said at the start, teamwork is more important than finance, than technology, than innovation, all these things. You need everybody in the same canoe paddling in the same direction. And so teamwork ultimately comes down to practicing this small set of principles over a long period of time. It's nothing to do with mastering sophisticated theories of all these different models and stuff. All it really is, is getting comfortable with the uncomfortable. It means embracing the difficulties that comes with working with other humans and being willing to push through that discomfort so that everybody gets stronger on the other side. So a lot of teams are inherently dysfunctional. And the first one at the bottom of the triangle was the absence of trust. And if you've got an absence of trust, then you're also going to have an absence of productive conflict on the team. 
And without conflict on the team, you're not going to have commitment with everyone. And without real commitment, there's going to be avoidance of accountability. And the fifth one is going to manifest, which is inattention to results. We got a great review here by uh, Wade Kong from Apple Podcasts saying, all good, five stars. Started with Meditations by Marcus Aurelius because I read it and didn't get it. Uh, The review the Adams gave made me read it again and enjoy it. I've listened to season four and have started scrolling back to season one, dot, dot, dot. What is the go with those songs? Cry, laugh face. (laughs) That is a very good question. Uh, Potentially needs to be revisited. Those songs seem to be popping up a little bit uh, at the moment. Who knows? Maybe another song one day. We love reading these reviews. Uh, It gives us a nice little boost, some nice little extra fuel to keep us going from week to week. If you could leave us a review on Uh, on Apple Podcasts. We love reading those or whatever podcast platform of your choice. Or if there is no review functionality, we'd love to just get a quick email. Uh, Whatyouwillearn.com is the website. Click on the contact us. Just shoot us a quick message. We love reading those. Thank you so much.